I think that comes from the ceiling. Mm-hmm. There's a recording in the ceiling that, that happens. Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Kenny and Kenny Squared. With the sports of the positive tip podcast. Kenny, so good to see you this morning. How's everything there in the lovely city of Cleveland? Everything's pretty good. Um, kind of an odd game for the Browns. I actually saw there was this guy that like bet that the Browns would cover on the spread, like because the spread was two and a half points. Oh, so boy. the Browns had to win by three. <laughs> they were up twenty four to three at half, and then they ended up winning by two. They won by so that guy's probably pretty mad this week. It's amazing how that works out. You know, it always it begs the theory. Oh man, a game fix and everything like that. It's just it's just the luck of the draw, you know. Now let, let's talk about that game for a second because uh, I, I watched probably the last eight or nine minutes red zone was really because because the other uh one o'clock games weren't that close so they were really staying on that one so the ravens go down the score first of all the ravens were without lamar jackson uh pretty early right and and then they they go down and they score and then they do something that you hardly ever see teams do anymore or do successfully anymore they recover an onside kick and so i'm like yeah, the Browns are, are done here. But their defense held up. It was four and out, and that was it. You know, uh, it was a great comeback by the Ravens. Um, now, the Browns have a lot of COVID issues, right? And uh, so what, we, what are your takes on a few things? Is there a little heat off of Baker Mayfield and the Browns after the win? And what's going on with all the COVID stuff, and which is really rampant? You know, we can talk about that in a little bit, but it's rampant throughout sports, but the Browns uh, hit pretty hard, as were the Rams. So give us a take on uh, the field there in Cleveland. Yeah, it's it's hard um, because, like, part of it is you look at Odell the last month or so, he's starting to hit his stride again. Yeah. Um, He's had three touchdowns each of the last three weeks. So it's like, well, maybe Baker still is the problem here. Maybe it wasn't the fact that Odell was hurting him. Um, I Honestly, I think that just Odell wasn't a good fit for Cleveland anyway. But that's just my opinion. Right. Um, there's still a little bit of heat on Baker because, especially in a game where you're winning 24 to 3, Lamar Jackson gets injured. Like, it should be a blowout. There's, there's not much of an excuse for not scoring – at all in the second half. Um, so I think that's one of the bigger concerns. And also out of those 24 points, it was seven from a Miles Garrett scoop and score. Um, so really, like, it seems like the offense still isn't clicking. And it was supposed to be the strength of the team. Um, I forgot who. I think it's Green Bay this week. Or maybe that's next week. The Browns? The Browns uh, schedule- they are playing on Saturday against the Raiders. Oh, it's the Raiders this week, and then they play the Packers. Right, right. And Packers they have a Christmas the weird Saturday games, uh, which are which are tough to pause and watch, you know. Um, yeah. So you're saying that there's still some heat there that uh, that it wasn't a convincing win. I mean, they're right in the playoff mix still, but but then again, almost everybody still is. So. Um, so that's interesting. And, and and what's the city reacting to all of the COVID uh, stuff? I feel like it's kind of like the here we go again a little bit. Because, um, yeah. like, the Browns went through this last year. Now, um, as of yesterday, they went into, which I didn't know was a thing, enhanced COVID protocols. Like, everyone's being tested every day, which I know if you're vaccinated, you don't get tested every day. Um, and then also they like the, right now they have eight players that have tested positive and more than likely will be out on Saturday. One of whom I think is interesting, Jarvis Landry, who missed time last year because of COVID. Yeah. So, um, and like at first I'm like, well, maybe it's a, a testing issue because I remember the giants had that issue. Like they thought like 13 guys had tested positive, but they were false positives. Um, but it seems like not necessarily for the Browns, um, but it's also a huge game 
on Saturday. They're only a game out of first place. Right now they do hold the second place in what's probably the craziest division in football. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the Ravens, they – I thought I saw – maybe it's them that plays Green Bay this week. Um, I'm going to take a look at the schedule. But, like, the Ravens may not have Lamar Jackson this week. And, like, the Browns kind of need to win. Yes, they do play Green Bay this week. Oh, wow. That, um, that's a great matchup. Yeah. So, I mean, right now the Browns are on the outside looking in, but they are, like, they would be technically the eighth seed. So, they win and you know, the Colts or, shockingly, the Bills lose, then they'd be right in the playoff hunt right there. So, yeah. Again. Yeah. Well, you mentioned the Bills, so let's let's go quickly around the NFL because I, I really want to dig into the Giants with you and, and Joe Judge because your reaction was a little bit strange, uh, you know, when when uh, uh, you saw that uh, you know Joe Judge is coming back for another year. So really quick, the the Bills, uh, what's wrong with them? Uh, they made a great comeback with the with Tampa, but they fell short. Tom Brady is Tom Brady; he's just unbelievable. He really is. But the Bills, uh, you know, all of a sudden find themselves holding on for dear life here. Uh, what, what's your take on them? Yeah, I don't know what's happened with them either. They started out the season like four and one or something like that. Yeah. But it seems like they've just kind of fallen off the rails. I don't know if it's a Josh Allen thing. I don't know if it's just kind of the they can't handle the expectations type of thing because sometimes like, Teams Maybe. that have a little bit of a target on their back, they're like, they're harder to like actually go up and thrive. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Cause right now, like they, they play the Patriots in a couple weeks, but Patriots have a two game lead. Yeah. The bills pretty much would have to win out, which means beating the Patriots and hope the Patriots lose one of their games. Bill Belichick losing in December is probably not going to happen. So Probably to me, one of the bigger surprises of like the season in general is the fact that the Patriots will win the East again. Um, it is, it, it, which it to me really is still is. wild. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I don't, I don't know what to make of the Bills. They, they seem to play these good games. I thought that game against the Pats the Monday night one. By the way, these have been two good last two weeks Monday night matchups. They've gotten pretty lucky here, but I thought that that was. Um, that was a game that they needed to have on their home turf. It was cold weather, which they liked, you know, I, and it, what a, what a difference. I think they, the temperature was in the twenties when they played Monday night and it was in the eighties. I think it was 81 degrees in Tampa when they played down there, but uh, that was the game. I mean, Tampa, that's a tough team to go in on the road to win. You got to protect that home field. And I think that, you know, Buffalo missed an opportunity. I think they'll still get in. I, I don't know that they'll beat the Pats that week, but I, I think somehow they'll they'll find their way in the playoff mix. It'd be hard to imagine that they don't. Um, Rams and, and Arizona, uh, all, you know, I'm not sure everybody is saying Arizona's the best team in the league now, you know. Although they didn't play a bad game, I thought the Rams just played very well. They had that spurt in the third quarter where they, you know, had the interception and they scored two touchdowns. And, and that seemed to really, uh, you know, put the game kind of in their, in their hands there. Well, what are your thoughts on, uh, on Rams and Cardinals? Yeah, that was a great game. Um, I think it does kind of show the Cardinals have kind of fallen a little bit to the pack. Um, but it, I think it says a lot about this, the Los Angeles Rams there. Your pick for the Super Bowl. Um, yeah. And – and someone made a comparison and I thought it was kind of interesting and I'll ask your thoughts on it. Now, remember at the beginning of the season last year, Tom Brady got just absolutely destroyed, got blown out by the saints a couple of times. Yeah. Didn't look good against like the Packers and a couple other teams. It was like right around Thanksgiving, like things started to click and then they didn't lose a game the rest of the year. Right. Um, right. I remember. Matt Stafford is now kind of in the same spot. Like he's been with the same system for years, or I guess the same organization for years, not the same yeah. system, 
But then he goes to like a winning culture and Sean McVay and the Rams. And like, he hasn't looked that great all year, but like the last few weeks, it seems like things are starting to click for him now. Um, the division is still a little bit out of reach. Well, I guess maybe not. They're only a game out, but like there's still the chance that the, the Cardinals will still win the division, but maybe they could be the, the Bucks of last year. Do you think they could do that? You know, they're, they're such an interesting team. Stafford shows these signs of, of just greatness. I don't know if you saw like that 54 yard throw, I mean, right on the money to Jefferson. And, I, and, and that was um, a touchdown I think in the first half, but it was just an unbelievable throw, which he's made a lot through his career. I, I just closed my eyes and picture him doing that with Calvin Johnson. So I, if he continues to play like he did the last couple of weeks, yes. Uh, and, and the Rams, though, they've got to stay healthy. They got hit by COVID as well. But they have got just uh, uh, all world players on defense, obviously. And and they've got like an all-star team on offense. And Cooper Cup, which is one of the best names ever, um, who is, <laughs> I mean, the guy is, uh, he's just unbelievable. He's, I, I think I read where, He's leading. Uh, he would have the trifecta for wide receivers this season ended. I think he's leading in average yards per catch, total catches, and and total yards, which is which is unprecedented. Wow. Um, it says it's been a long time since anybody did that. And, and so, I, so the answer to your question is yes. They they could be that team that just goes on a run here and has finally found themselves and and figures it out. So I I don't know. Well. We'll see, but I, it's a great point you bring up. I, I think they are capable, and it's a good comparison with Brady. Although, again, being in the same conference with Tampa, that's, it's going to be really hard to beat them. All right, so I, I, I got to hear you about the Giants. I'm going to give you plenty of space here. Jets, a really good defensive effort on Sunday. Nothing really to speak of on offense, three field goals. You know, it is what it is this season. And the Giants, pretty much a lot of the same. The Chargers, the Chargers are a very good team. So that would have been a tough, that's a tough task to go into L.A. like that and, and beat them, especially this time of year. But, but then Joe Judge gets uh, an extension. They say, not an extension, but they say he would definitely be back for his third year. You reacted kind of weird, said you'd like to talk about it today. So let's hear it. What, what are you thinking of Joe Judge coming back? All right. So I told you I kind of have mixed feelings on it because, well, number one, I'll stick with the positive first. Um, I think having consistency in coaching is important, um, especially when it comes to, like, trying to rebuild and retool like I feel like a lot of times when organizations are rebuilding because I mean let's be honest the Giants are rebuilding yeah right now they're looking at possibly two top five draft picks um so like we're at the point where you got to rebuild it I think sometimes where teams kind of mess it up is switching the coach every couple years because they don't think they found the right one and then that coach goes on to do great things so I get that. Um, also, apparently, I had read somewhere yesterday that um, uh, the Maris think that Joe Judge is like the next Bill Belichick. So they wouldn't give up on him after two years. So I, I completely understand giving him, getting him, keeping him on. Um, Dave Gettleman is expected to retire slash get fired at the end of the year. Right. And where my biggest concern is, is a lot of times when a coach stays and the GM goes, the coach gets way too much power. Huh. And okay. Okay. sometimes like you look at like Pete Carroll, that's kind of happened with him and look at where the Seahawks are now. Um, Russell Wilson wants out and they've just been absolutely dreadful. Yeah. Um, especially on the, like Pete Carroll's a defensive head coach and he, the defense hasn't been great. 
Um, so I think kind of in that regard, I'm a little nervous to give Joe Judge a little bit more power, especially since it doesn't feel like he's earned it. Mm. Um, this team hasn't done that well. Like last year, it seemed like they were fighting pretty well. They they were six and ten, so it wasn't like like they weren't horrible. And even some of their losses were still pretty close. Like I think of um, having the Bucks down to the, the wire there last yeah. year. Yeah. Having a couple other like really good teams where they played well. Yeah. I feel like the last few weeks though, they've just looked absolutely flat. Like mm-hmm. offensively, it's just not watchable. They're not scoring. Saquon Barkley is supposed to be like, I mean, Giants drafted him very high in the NFL draft and he hasn't delivered at all. Um, And I guess you're going to have to make a decision on Daniel Jones. I don't know. It seems more and more like this, this neck injury that he has is probably going to end his season. Uh, And having a neck injury for quarterback kind of scares me. So I would probably say, yeah, let's just move off of him. Cause it's not like, Cause like, I, I remember Peyton Manning had like that neck issue. Like he was able to come back from it cause he's Peyton Manning. Yeah. Daniel Jones is not Peyton Manning. Uh, yeah. Especially if you're going to you have a new GM, you might as well get a new quarterback in there. Um, but I think if Joe Judge is well, since Joe Judge is going to stay, I think that means that they should get someone that really gels well with him. Um, cause if you're going to go with them, you might as well get someone that get, gets along with him, put the people around judge. That's going to really work well with him. Um, don't just go out there and get, Hey, this guy is a good GM. Like get someone that probably would fit him better. That knows his style, knows his system, knows the type of personnel he needs to thrive Yeah, because you can have great players and they just don't work well. You know, Dell with the Browns, like he's yeah. a great player. He just doesn't work well. That's a really interesting take that you have. Uh, let me let me ask you a few follow up questions. So, do you think that Jones is or isn't Judge's choice for quarterback of the future? Um, I think he probably isn't. Um, because like Judge didn't draft him. I feel like a lot of times, uh, coaches, GMs like to draft their own quarterback to say like this is my baby and I made this person amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, but with, with Jones, I think he's kind of just like, well, he's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. I don't know who else you would put there. There's well, been that- talk now that Russell Wilson could go to the giants, but I don't know if that's the best idea either. Well, that was going to be my next question. Where do you go? Uh, you know, it, 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 up until last year, it's really, and it seemed historically in the NFL almost to uh, make these trades for quarterbacks. And then you had a couple in the off season that were really interesting with, you know, Jerry Goff and, um, uh, you know, Carson Wentz and, and of course Stafford. Um, so I, I guess the giants could go there, but I can't see like trading Daniel Jones for, let's say Russell Wilson, you know what I mean? And, and no knock on Jones. But they, they would have to trade a bunch of draft picks, I think, to get to get Russell Wilson. Are the Giants willing to do that, right? And, and let's just even not say Russell Wilson. There's probably a couple of other quarterbacks that are veterans that can, you know, use or benefit from a change of scenery. You know, Russell Wilson probably would be, uh, you know, number one at this point in, in his career. What else does he have to really prove in Seattle, you know? But, but maybe uh, uh, Derek Carr uh, with the Raiders would probably be another one that would would benefit from a change of scenery there's probably a few others but the giants would have to give a boatload of draft picks to get somebody like like that even though those quarterback russell wilson i think at one time was a great quarterback but also you have deshaun watson obviously with all the checkered pass and everything that that's obviously sitting out this whole season now uh so do you do that or is there somebody that we're not seeing in the draft again i wish you know and you're probably in the same boat as me. I wish I was more up on, you know, college. And I could tell you, hey, there's, there's a great quarterback at Utah State or something like that that, that we don't know about. But I, I don't know that there's a really top flight, you know, Joe Burrow type quarterback coming out of college, you know, either. So uh, 
uh, what, what do the Giants do? I mean, they're, they're some, some, do you do you take some draft choices and and go all in for just what what you hope might be a franchise quarterback? Yeah, I don't know. Um, Cause yeah, it doesn't seem like the last like four or five years, there's been like at least two or three, like very solid choices for quarterback. I mean, look at the AFC where you got guys like Patrick Mahomes. I know Deshaun Watson was a part of that, but he's not anymore. Baker Mayfield, um, Justin Herbert, who's been spectacular this year, Kyler Murray in the NFC, like list goes on and on. But it seems like this year there's not necessarily that guy. And the Giants have two top five, or I'll say yeah. safely two top ten draft picks this year. Yeah. And that's that's kind of frustrating because you can easily yeah. like, oh, yeah, we'll draft our franchise quarterback and then draft another really good piece, like a wide receiver or an offensive lineman or whatever. Yeah. But I think if you don't – if you feel like you don't have a better option than Daniel Jones early on in the draft – either trade down, get some more picks, or you just surround Daniel Jones with better weapons, um, yeah. which I tried to do this year, but it seems like everyone got hurt and then everyone just completely underperformed. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'll give you, and we can, we can jump over to, to the Knicks because I want you and I to spend some time on them. Um, but I'll give you – one person that really comes to mind of recent, right? I, I, I probably use Jim Plunkett a, a lot um, because as a kid, he stood out in terms of he was a, a, he was almost exactly like Daniel Jones, really struggled his first several years in the league. Patriots finally traded him to the 49ers. He struggled there. They cut him and the Raiders pick him up and the guy, you know, wins two Super Bowls with the Raiders. Not late, late in his career, but he's probably in his early 30s, you know, which at that time was, was late in, 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 a, in a career. Ryan Tannehill is one who really recently comes to mind as just floundered in Miami, was, was really a, a top flight college quarterback, floundered in Miami. And look at these last three years uh, with Tennessee. He's gotten into the right system. They're using his talent the right way. And the guy is yeah, nobody really talks much about him, but his stats are like uh, so good these last three years in terms of his turnover ratio and everything like that. And that team is obviously a contender, you know, uh, certainly a contender, but nobody would be surprised if Tennessee wound up in the Super Bowl. Um, so I, I think that they just have to be careful if their system is matching Jones's talent, because obviously Jones has a lot of talent, um, but is the system matching it? And you know, to your point, maybe it never will if, if this is going to be the same coach now. And no knock on, on Judge. Maybe he has his own system that he needs a quarterback that fits into that, whether it's a Derek Carr, whether it's a Russell Wilson. I mean, I think you get a Russell Wilson, you've got to then build a system around him, not vice versa, right? Um, but maybe someone like a Derek Carr, who's been good, who's shown flashes, who probably has a lot of talent uh, that is not flourishing with the Raiders right now. Um, you know, maybe he might be someone that might be more reasonable to get. I don't know. I, you, I, the Giants, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes right now. They've got some really, really tough decisions. And remember, we talked about this several weeks ago, the Giant fan base, which is the most patient that I've ever seen in sports. They're definitely by far the most patient here in New York. Um, but they're, they're really an old school fan. They have lost patience with the team. They really have. Um, and... and I, I, if, if they start bailing on their season tickets and everything like that, you'll see the Maras will, will certainly push to do something drastic in the off season, you know? Yeah. Um, I was also looking free agent quarterbacks. Here's your three options. <laughs> um, Jameis Winston, Teddy Bridgewater and Marcus Mariota. So, yeah. Not really great options there. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the Giants also, they've been the worst team in the last five years, worse than Detroit, worse than Jacksonville, uh, worse than Cincinnati. Like, Cleveland went 0-16, and, and they still have a worse record than them. So, like, the Giants, they need to they need to step it up. Like, this has to be the mark of, like, them actually, like, improving in the division. It's uh, no also, doubt. like, there's still questions about whether Jalen Hurts is good. 
Um, Dak Prescott hasn't looked great the last couple of weeks. Like the Giants could easily have the second best quarterback in their division, but it seems like they have maybe the third or fourth. Yeah. Um, although maybe I, I don't think Daniel Jones is worse than Taylor Haneke, but oh. I don't know. They got they're at least in the playoff hunt. I, I mean, I know they lost on uh, Sunday with Dallas, but they're at least in the hunt, you know? Um, all right. That's true. I, it, I would say, I don't think it's an understatement. This is probably the most important giant offseason <clears throat> in a long time. I, I, I would, would you, would you agree with that? Yeah, I okay. would agree. All right. All right. We'll see what happens. Let's shift gears to the NBA and, I, I texted you this a couple of days ago that I am now officially worried about the Knicks because now they're four games, I think, right, under 500. And you and I talk about this all the time. It's it's hard in the NBA, man, when you – because it's hard to go on a seven, eight, nine game winning streak in the NBA. It really is. Baseball, we see it all the time. We'll see teams rattle off eight, nine in a row. All of a sudden, they're back in the mix, you know. Uh, but the NBA, unless you're one of these elite teams, it's really hard to go on these runs because, you know, you, you have tough teams all the time, you know, coming in. And, and now this has been a tough stretch for the Knicks in terms of the schedule, but here I, I was worried about them before last night, but now I'm even more worried. And, and, and I have one of my fun stats is around the three point stuff. So um, Steph Curry, great, great job. I, I actually like that. It was here in New York. It's almost like, um, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, but you know, how close was he to come to the Knicks, you know, in the, in that draft that year. And he wanted to play for the Knicks, but you know, the Warriors got him at number seven, the Knicks, you know, drafted number eight, the rest is history. So, but, and so he gets the record at Madison Square Garden, right? But here's the thing. So the Warriors now, I think 22 and five, right? Really good team. And they've, they've kind of really retooled because there were several players playing last night. I'm like, who is that? Who is that, you know? Uh, but they, they were playing so well. But here's the thing. The Warriors had a back-to-back, <laughs> right? They had a back-to-back from Indiana. Same like the Knicks had, you know, last week. That I told you I was worried about. They had a back-to-back. Their flight got, got delayed, then canceled. They sat on a tarmac for like 2, 3 in the morning. They took them back to their hotel room, and then they um, – flew them out to New York early in the morning, yesterday morning, right? This is after playing a game in Indiana, tough game in Indiana. So now they have all the distraction of Steph Curry, of him getting a three-pointer. His celebrity role is packed. Ray Allen is there. Reggie Miller's calling the game. You know, and, and to Curry's credit, he gets it pretty early in the game, right? He hits one and then he hits the second one relatively early in the first quarter. And so they get that out of the way, but afterwards they were so flat. They couldn't, they couldn't hit a shot. They were just so distracted, so flat. And they were there for the taking because they had to be really tired as well. And I'm like, this is a game that Knicks got to win. They got the Warriors on a night where they're tired, they're distracted, they're flat, and yet they just couldn't take it. And uh, listen, every team has the COVID stuff. Uh, R.J. Barrett was out, obviously. Obi Toppin, Quentin Grimes, who had a great game against the Bucks. You know, and these are tough teams they're playing, right? They played the Bucks and the Warriors, so I get that. But that was a game last night that really is showing me that something is seriously off with this team, and I I, I can't figure it out. Alec Burke at some uh, at some point was like, you know, one for ten, <laughs> you know, from the field, and um. You know, I just, I don't know. Uh, so it's it, it's tough because the season, it it gets late early in the NBA. It, it really does. Because if you kind of fall out of contention, it's real, it's so hard, you know, to make up this ground. So I'm anxious to hear. I'm worried, and I don't know actually what they do. And I'm almost now leaning for it. Maybe there is a spark. Evan Fournier is another one that I just, what is wrong with him? I'm like wondering why he's not on the bench and Kemba Walker should be at least give him another shot here. I was surprised they didn't bring him in uh, these last couple of games. And McBride, the guy they brought off off the bench, and uh, he's the kid out of West Virginia, if I remember right. Man, oh man, he was lighting it up for a while. You know, so some of these guys they have on the bench are really good, but I, 
why not give Walker a, 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 a try? Fournier has showed me not, he's like scared to shoot. He's driving in and, and he's got clean shot and he's passing it back out. I'm really, really, as you can tell, I'm, about the- worried, I'm worried about the Knicks, man, because uh, there's such high hopes for this year. Yeah. So I'll keep quiet. I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, well, real quick on um, on Fournier, like the whole point of, of the Knicks getting him was to be like the guy that can shoot the ball. So it He's does seem a little... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just seems kind of bizarre. Um, yeah, I'll first say that this has been a brutal stretch anyway for the Knicks. I mean, having to face Milwaukee, Golden State, um, Cleveland's been really good. Um, who else? Denver was in there. Ugh. Chicago, but yeah. yeah, like the Nets. But I will say this: yes, there's a lot of difficult teams there, but the Knicks are supposed to be going toe to toe with those teams. Yeah. Um, but I'm looking here. Here's the schedule up until Christmas Day. Um. They're at Houston, at Boston, home against Detroit, home against Washington, and then Christmas Day against Atlanta. So out of I'll, – I'll leave Atlanta. So out of the next four games, they really need to be three and one. Um, Washington will be hard, but, like, you got to beat Houston. you got to beat the Celtics, and you really should be beating the Pistons too. Um, Houston is like one of the last 10, I think, right? Houston all of a sudden woke up and they won like eight oh, really? out of 10. Yeah. Yeah. But you're right. They they should go at least three and one. You're right. Um, Cause then at that point, instead of being four under 500 or three under, I mean, or two under. Um, and I mean, like it, it might be hard to beat Atlanta, Oh, that'll be a fun atmosphere on Christmas day. I know yeah. we always say, Oh, we're going to watch it. And then kind of never do. But <laughs> um, I think, I think for me, the more challenging thing is kind of like with you, I don't really know what's exactly wrong with this team. Julius Randall had a great game yesterday, but he seemed really off. Yeah. Um, I, I agree. Thibodeau, let, let Kemba Walker get some of this garbage time. Like have him. Cause like, I think back to, I know this is a weird comparison, but something that came to mind. I think back to when Jeremy Lin first popped on the scene, he came in and like, it was like a 20 point deficit. He came in and just lit it up. Like yeah. give Kemba Walker a zero pressure situation. And I think he'll be fine. Yeah. Like Kemba Walker was an all-star just a few years ago. It's yeah. not like we're talking about some like guy that's never been able to prove it now. I think it also shows that a lot of the guys that are missed, like the three guys that are missing are a lot more vital to the Knicks maybe than we would think. Like Obi maybe. Toppin to me is like the, the guy that provides the spark off the bench. they are playing um, well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, RJ Barrett just started playing better again. And then yeah. Yeah. Um, which I mean, the COVID stuff, hopefully it'll stop at three because like, I mean, the Knicks are 100% vaccinated. You couldn't play in New York unless you were. I know. Um, yeah. So hopefully, and I mean, obviously the Knicks aren't the only guys dealing with COVID. Bulls have nine players that tested positive. Somebody Great. big, was it Giannis maybe? Or someone on the Bucks, I, I think, tested, just tested yeah. positive for COVID. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So like the COVID, yeah, it really stinks. It seems like it's going a lot more rampant, but like, it can't be an excuse. You still gotta, you still gotta perform on the court. Um, and Julius Randle doesn't have COVID. Evan Fournier, they're paying him a lot of money. He, he doesn't have COVID. He scored two points last night. Um, so I don't know. It's it's hard because it doesn't seem like there's a great solution. But maybe it does have to be kind of like a big shakeup up in the starting rotation here. I yeah I. You know, it, um, it, it'll, if they continue to go down this road, it'll be very tempting to go out and get John Wall or, you know, uh, one of these guys that they probably would be a, a, just a very quick fix, you know, uh, but, but long-term wouldn't really help uh, the team. So, I, I, you know, I, I, it's just – I hope it's not something that we're not seeing with, with Thibodeau 
because it, this kind of fits a little bit of a pattern in terms of his second, third year in, in the places that he's been as a head coach in Chicago and Minnesota is, is where he kind of wears, wears out, wears out his welcome almost. So I'm hoping that that's not the case. I, I don't think it is. Uh, I, I think it is a combination of a, of a bad stretch and there's something going on with the chemistry that I just can't figure out. Okay. Uh, listen, we, uh, let's see after this four game stretch. If they go all in four in this four game stretch, they were really, they were, they were already not even at the halfway mark fighting for our playoff lives. Um, so and let's get some fun facts. I'll give mine really, really quick because you always have these great ones to close this out with. And so uh, the three point one has been amazing, and and uh, it has really changed the game. And I hadn't. You know, it was it was great because Reggie Miller was doing the game. I watched all of the TNT uh, feed last night. Just got wanted to really hear Reggie Miller's take on it. And you know, when Reggie Miller broke the three point record back in the '90s, he broke it from a guy named Dale Ellis. I remember him. He was uh, a really good shooter. He was just all, you know, I don't want to say all he could do was shoot, but he was just a shooter, man. He could he could shoot. He played with several teams, but. When Reggie Miller broke the record, do you know what the average amount of three-point attempts were when he broke the record? Like the five, six? Amount, yeah, it was three. The average amount of wow. three-pointers teams took every night, and this was in the 90s, not that long ago, right, was three. And when Ray Allen broke the record in 2002, do you know what the average amount was? Nine? It was, uh, it was 14, 14. Uh, so, it, so it went up big time then, right? So, so guys like Reggie Miller and Ray Allen started to really change the game, right? But not that drastically. So obviously Curry broke it last night. Do you know at this moment how many three-pointers teams are averaging? Like 50? 35. 35. Wow. That's a lot. So 35, three, 30, that's the average. So you imagine there's some nights where teams are throwing up 50. You know, there's some nights where teams are probably throwing up 20, 25. But it is really, I, I, and I started to think about how much this has changed the game. And it's changed the college game as well, because obviously it hasn't been that long that three-pointers were in college. And the three-point line isn't obviously as far, they need to just, change that put the three-point line as far back in college as in the NBA but it's not it's a few feet in right but it is amazing how much the game has changed and it is amazing to me how many players easily make these really long shots I mean if you're on the court and you're 30 feet away or 25 feet away even it's it's a long shot to make consistently. And you've got a guy like Curry that has made a living off of it. And I mean, there's, but there's so many other players that shoot these threes and just, you know, but I'll say this and, and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, you've heard me say it before. And I think we're seeing this with the Knicks, unfortunately. This is one of the things I think is wrong with them. They fell in love with the three early in the season. And last night, <laughs> some of these guys couldn't hit the ocean. They're just throwing these threes up like Alec Burks. I mean, he's just throwing threes up, you know? I mean, just – and so you live by the three. You also can die by the three because you fall in love with that, and you're thinking that's going to get you back in the game quicker. Um, I, you know, DeMar DeRozan, who I, I've always liked as a player, but I like him even more now because he really takes three-pointers, and he's just become a master of the mid-range jumper, and he's up there among the league leaders in scoring. And which is uh, last thing I'll say, one of the also reasons why I, I Dwayne Wade was always one of my favorite not Nick players because he really took three point shots. But he's one of the best players of our era. He always hit the mid range jumper. You know, he never, you know, it was rare that he took a three pointer. You know, so while I like the three pointers, I think it's effective. I think late in the game, especially, it's exciting. It's really changed the game a lot. And to think teams are averaging now, you know, you figure about 25 years ago, teams were averaging only three a game. Now they're averaging 35 a game. Amazing. Anyway, let's hear your fun facts, which are always great. 
All right. So I actually, I'll add on to the Steph Curry breaking the record here. I have two things on that. First of all, um, it took Ray Allen 1,300 games to break um, Reggie Miller's record. It took Steph Curry 789 games to break Ray Allen's record. Oh, my God. So, um, <laughs> like, almost half the wow. games. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, so, but also what's kind of interesting is the full circle with this whole thing. So, when Reggie Miller broke the three-point record, um, a guy named Steve Kerr was on the court. Um, when Ray Allen set, when Ray Allen broke Reggie Miller's record, Steve Kerr was the broadcaster that night. And now when Curry sets it, Kerr was broadcasting and Reggie Miller, or Kerr was coaching and Reggie wow. Miller was broadcasting. Wow. So wow. kind of interesting. I kind of caught that when uh, Reggie Miller was talking about it. Yeah. Um, wow. Wow. Um, Come in, huh? I want to talk yeah, um, yeah, also there's on. there's a couple of interesting things um, a couple of interesting things with uh, with baseball that I'd meant uh, that I'd kind of seen so obviously hopefully we'll have some good news that the Mets are hiring Buck Showalter yeah um, it got me kind of thinking that like how many managers like win in their first season so um, I looked this up, rookie managers that have won the World Series. This is oh um, wow. This is like when you're first ever a manager. Wow. The first year ever, like um it's happened five times in history and only three times in our lifetimes. Um so I'm only gonna mention the three because like we don't know guys from like the 20s and the 30s. Um Alex Cora. 2018 with the Red Sox. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Bob Brenly. Yeah. 2001. That one I knew, right? The Diamondbacks. Okay. okay. This one might, it's technically in your lifetime, but it's still, this one's a little older too. Ralph Hoke of the 61 Yankees. Oh, Ralph Hauk. Yeah. <laughs> Hauk. Yeah. <laughs> really? So, so 61 Yankees. He had to have probably taken over for Casey Stengel, I guess, right? Um, is my guess probably when yeah. Casey Stengel went to go manage the Mets. And so Ralph Hauk had never been a manager before. Wow. That, that is so interesting. And so as a, a Bob Brenly, I remember, because um, he was a broadcaster, uh, which he is now. And then he, he went to managing and then, wow. Okay. And obviously Cora, I had because Cora was a coach for a while, so I hadn't really realized that. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a great one. Great uh, one. Wow. Yeah, so, I mean, and that's not including, like, say, managers that have managed before and they won a World Series for the first time, like, with a new team. Yeah. Um, but it'll be – I'd have to look that one up and see if I can find that. But I did find the rookie manager, so I wanted to share that. Um, I saw a couple other interesting ones. One is a baseball one. One's a football one. So, um, Hall of Fame is coming up within about a month or so. Um, here's a guy that doesn't really get as much love for the Hall of Fame. I don't even know if he's still on the ballot. Um, the man, the myth, the legend, Bobby Abreu. So, listen to these stats here. He made it on base 39,079 times, 921 extra base hits, 400 stolen bases, and about 2,400 games. Um, this next guy, I won't say his name, but I'll give his stats first. Um, 3965 times on base. So, um, only a few lower than Bobby Abreu, 763 extra base hits, significantly less than Abreu, 319 stolen bases, almost a hundred less than Abreu in 2,400 ish games. You know, who that guy is it's Tony Gwynn. That's Tony Gwynn. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. Well, so, so I don't know. So you're making a case for Abreu to be in the Hall of Fame. I don't even know if he's still on the ballot. Uh, he was such a good player by Abreu for a lot of years. And he was just really, really consistent. Wow. I hadn't really thought much of him until you just said that. I wonder if he's still on the ballot. It's not that long ago that he retired, right? Because I somehow remember him with the Yankees uh, at the end of his career. And then I remember with the Mets also. Um, 
Wow. Wow. That, that, but Tony Gwynn has that less of uh, stats. Wow. I, I, that blew me away. That blew me away. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was, I was like, whoa. Yeah. Um, but I guess he is. Oh, wait. This is 2021. He might be on the ballot this year. I don't know. I'll have to look. Yeah. Um, last one is about the guy that never seems to get old, and that's Tom Brady. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but since he joined the Bucks in the red zone, Tom Brady has 60 touchdowns and zero interceptions. 60 touchdowns, zero interceptions in the red zone. Uh, Listen, I, uh, the only thing I'm going to say, that is an unbelievable stat, but the only thing I'll say is anyone who makes an argument that someone else is the greatest quarterback of all time that's not named Tom Brady, come on. And, and not, no shade on any of these great, great quarterbacks like Peyton and Dan Marino and Terry Bradshaw. I, I mean, 60 touchdowns, and this is two years. He's not even, not even a full two years yet. And he's got no interception, 60 touchdowns in the red zone. That's unbelievable. That's an unbelievable yeah. stat. Oh, Bobby Abreu, by the way, is still on the uh, – he's on the ballot. He got 8% last year. So 8%. Man, he's not getting any love. He's not going to get in. But, uh, but he deserves yeah. some consideration for sure. Wow. Wow. And he had a great career. He really did. All right, man. Hey, take us home. All right. This is Kenny Squared End. And Kenny. With Sports on the Positive Tip, we will see you guys next week. Absolutely. Take care, everybody.